Ik uh, wil first start in Dutch. Uh, goedenavond, welkom op de eerste informatiesessie <coughs> over de Democratische Federatie van Noord-Syrië. Uh, wordt ook wel autonome regio van Noord- en Noord-Syrië genoemd. Of uh, Syrisch Koerdistan. En eigenlijk, uh, voor wat de Koerden betreft, is het nog eenvoudiger. Die, die houden het op uh, Rojava. En uh, daar gaan we nog de koos op terugkomen, op die naam natuurlijk. Uh, nog even mezelf voorstellen, voor de mensen die me niet kennen. Mijn naam is Erik uh, Franken en ik werk intussen al sinds een, een tweetal uh, jaartjes als stafmedewerker voor het Koerdisch Instituut. En bij gevolg heb ik dan ook een uh, gezonde interesse in alles wat te maken heeft met de Koerdische regio's en wat daar gaande is. Um, ik ga starten met een praktische mededeling. Dus er, hebben, uh, er heeft zich een gemengd publiek uh, uh, ingeschreven voor deze sessie. En uh, daarom zal de presentatie dan ook uh, afwisselend in Nederlands en Engels zijn, maar overwegend Engels toch wel eens waar. Um, we hebben eigenlijk voor deze sessie geen simultane vertaling voorzien. Maar het doel van deze sessie is dat die uh, heel interactief wordt. Uh, dat is toch wel de bedoeling. Um, en dat alle inbreng van de deelnemers uh, meer dan welkom is. Commentaar, opmerkingen, vragen. Dus zo gaat dat concreet gaan. Van zodra er iets is dat u niet begrijpt omwille van de taal bijvoorbeeld, laat het heel even weten en ik zal mijn best doen om dat uh, beknopt voor u te vertalen. <coughs> Hoe kan dat dan? Dat kan u doen heel eenvoudig. Door uh, in een Zoom-functie heb je daar uh, raise hand, een handje opsteken. Ik zal dat wel merken en ik zal u dan wel een platform geven. Maar u kan u zelf ook een muten hoor, zoals ik al zei. Het is echt de bedoeling dat het, dat het heel interactief wordt, deze sessie. Uh, gebruik maken van de chatfunctie mag, maar ik ga dat niet altijd in het oog hebben, denk ik. We hebben daar te veel werk voor. Dus je mag echt wel interveneren op die manier uh, door je micro af te zetten en weer terug uh, even in de meeting te komen. Uh, bovendien, en dat wil ik er toch nog bij vertellen, krijgt iedereen de kans om uh, nadien het nog eens terug te zien op mijn nemen. Deze, ik ben nog niet op dit ogenblik aan het opnemen. Dus uh, dit is een, een opname dat we achteraf ook nog publiceren op onze website. Uh, dus dat geeft u rustig de kans om alles nog eens rustig te bekijken. Ik heb voor deze sessie, of wij hebben voor deze sessie ongeveer een uur gepland. Uh, maar als dat iets langer zou uitlopen, dat is ook weer geen probleem. Vooral als het interactief wordt, is dat des te leuker. En dan mag het wat mij betreft, en afhankelijk van hoe de timing voor de mensen is, er is het ook weer een, een tijdje langer. I will switch to English now uh, for, and welcome all participants in English and thank you for joining this webinar uh, concerning the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, well a region that among Kurds is uh, also known as Rojava. So my name is Erik uh, Franken, I'm uh, your host for this evening and since about two years I work for the Kurdish Institute Brussels uh, and you can imagine as a consequence uh, I've put a lot of interest in the Kurdish uh, freedom movement over the last two years also. My introduction was also in Dutch, you noticed, uh, due to the fact that a mixed uh, audience of people uh, subscribe to this webinar. Um, so uh, the remainder of this, this, this uh, presentation will be both in English and Dutch. Now, um, how will everything work in practice? Uh, we didn't foresee something like simultaneous translation. But the idea is to, of this webinar is to make it really interactive and that all participants can share their ideas, their comments and questions. Uh, the moment that there is something that you do not understand, please let me know uh, due to, for, for instance, the language uh, barrier. Um, so I'm, raise your hand. There is that uh, famous function within Zoom to, to, to raise hand and I will notice that and at that moment take, take uh, the platform and ask a question and I will do my very best to translate as brief as possible and summarize uh, what has been said. Um, but also moreover, please note also that we record this, this uh, session uh, so, and we will publish it also on our website which makes that you can see it afterwards also. You will find it on the, via the website and find it back and you will uh, be able to review everything. Um, we planned about, well, let's say an hour for this session, but uh, it doesn't mind or we don't mind if uh, it takes a little bit longer. Uh, if it becomes interactive, it would be very nice, of course. We do, in that case, we really, really don't care. Et malheureusement, bah, enfin malheureusement, ben, dernièrement, quelques mots en français parce que j'ai compris qu'il y a une ou deux personnes aussi qui sont francophones qui se sont inscrits. 
Euh, mais très bref, j'espère que vous êtes dans la capacité ou la possibilité de suivre euh, notre webinaire euh, parce que la majorité sera présentée en anglais et en néerlandais. Mais n'hésitez pas de toute façon de poser les questions, je vous passerai la parole et notez aussi que de toute façon ce sera enregistré et, et publié, publié sur notre site web. And uh, finally, for the Kurdish participants, Rojbas. And that's about uh, the, far, the, few, the few words in Kurmanji that I speak. Uh, Kurmanji Nizanil, I think. So that's, that's about it. Before switching back to Dutch, uh, I would like already to introduce you our speaker for this evening. Um, and as Kurdish Institute, I, uh, um, we are very, really very proud to welcome Zuzan Alush. Uh, Zuzan, in her professional life, uh, works uh, as an independent political and development consultant. But um, in the meantime, she's also, and correct me, Zuzan, afterwards if I'm wrong, she's spokeswoman for the Syrian Democratic Council. Uh, and uh, oh, in fact, also co-chair of development and humanitarian affairs for that council. Um, and you can imagine that she more than well placed uh, to provide us this evening a broad picture of the unique uh, civil society model in uh, Rojava. Uh, about a week ago, Zosan left Brussels here to be present in Northeast Syria. So that's uh, a lucky thing that we have something like internet making it possible to communicate uh, this evening. And we hope, of course, that technology uh, doesn't uh, bring us in uh, embarrassment for this evening uh, and that communication is fluently and remains well. Um, so as I will really come back to you after that I've, I will take a little bit, a few minutes more because after this practical introduction, I would like to introduce the objectives of the six sessions that we are going to organize in the coming weeks and months. And uh, meanwhile, I would also inform the participants about uh, the objectives of the, the project that the Curtis Institute uh, will perform this year. Um, wat ik er juist ook gezegd heb, uh, in Engels uh, ga ik nog heel kort even herhalen in Nederlands. Dus de spreker heb ik al voorgesteld, in Engels ook. Het is Zuzan Alush. Ik kan jullie verzekeren dat we echt wel een goede keuze daarin geen betere spreker konden vinden voor het thema van deze avond. Uh, er zijn er heel vier op. Uh, Broeps Halven is Zuzan een uh, politiek consulent, maar het is nog veel belangrijker dat zij ook uh, woordvoerder is, woordvoerster van uh, hier in Europa voor de Syrische uh, Democratische Raad. Um, en zij legt dan vooral de, de focus op uh, ontwikkeling, humanitaire zaken enzovoort. Nu, een week geleden was zij hier nog aanwezig op het Kurdish Instituut en intussen vervoert zij terug een paar plichten in uh, Noord-Syrië. Uh, de communicatie hopelijk uh, gaat die goed verlopen en uh, laat hij ons niet in de steek, de technologie. Uh, we zullen wel zien. Nu, we komen even tot de essentie van deze webinar. Er gaan dus een zestal webinars over Rojava door uh, in de komende weken en maanden. Um, en ja, specifiek natuurlijk over het unieke samenlevingsmodel van Rojava. Ik vermoed dat de meeste onder de deelnemers zich heel bewust hebben ingeschreven omdat ze toch al een en ander opgevangen hebben van Rojava of gelezen. Uh, en dan heb ik het uiteraard over specifieke dingen zoals de Rojava-revolutie, het ontstaan van uh, de participatieve democratie al daar, gendergelijkheid, wat dat toch uh, voor die regio in het Midden-Oosten bijzonder uniek is. En dan verwijs ik uh, uiteraard naar, naar uh, autoritaire regimes uh, rondom, uh, die, um, rondom die regio. En dan vooral, uh, daar gaan we het vanavond ook veel over hebben, over de inspraak. Um, en... en, en ja, dankzij eigenlijk wat ze daar noemen een getrapt systeem van uh, de lokale, regionale uh, besturen. Um, heeft iedereen in Rojava of iedereen die er leeft een stem en heeft hij daar ook inspraak in het beleid? Uh, en als ik zeg iedereen, dat is dan onafgezien van uh, hun afkomst, hun cultuur, hun religie. Uh, en je moet dan wel rekening houden, dat in, en dat zullen misschien toch sommigen onder jullie weten, dat is een enorme smeltkruis van mensen daar, van volkeren, naast de Koerden en Yezidi, Arabieren, uh, Aram, Armeniërs, Arameërs, Assyriërs, uh, Syriani. Ik kan nog zo even Turk mee en ik kan nog even doorgaan. Dus um, Rojava is eigenlijk wel een, on, een onwaarschijnlijke boeiende materie om op zich op te dagen. In ieder geval boeiend genoeg voor ons, voor het Koerdisch Instituut, om daar uh, in het komende jaar, uh, het jaar dat komt nu, gaan we daar zeker ons volledig over buigen over dat thema. En uh, met goedkeuring van uh, de Vlaamse gemeenschap gaan we in de tweede helft van 2021 ook een, uh, uh, met, met Rojava waarden en principes verder experimenteren. Uh, 
Um, we gaan dat uh, vooral starten op het, op het lokale niveau, uh, met op de buurt- en wijkcomité's, uh, lokale adviesraden. En we hebben eigenlijk wat dat betreft al, al, al wel wat contact genomen met uh, steden en gemeenten. En uh, sommige daarvan hebben al zeker enthousiast gereageerd. Dus nu hopelijk dat uh, nou, de coronasituatie dat allemaal een beetje gaat toelaten. Dat zal nog moeten blijken. Um, maar dus voilà, dat is, uh, dat, is, dat is wat er staat nu als jullie. Ik ga er niet te veel meer over uitweiden, over, over dat project op zich. Uh, ik stel voor, als jullie daar meer over willen weten, zeker eens te gaan een kijkje nemen op onze website. En zeker ook in de komende weken, maanden, gaat dat meer en meer gespuist worden naarmate dat wij evolueren uh, in dat project. Um, dan, uh, op het einde van, die, van, van de zes webinars dat wij organiseren, uh, dan moet er uiteraard zoiets zijn als vinden wij toch als een soort van eindproduct. Wat komt er eigenlijk uit, uh, uit al wat we, wat we hier besproken hebben? En, en, en ik kan me voorstellen dat dat heel interessante materie gaat worden. En met al die informatie die we dan gaan verzameld hebben, uh, gaan we ook iets doen in het kader van dat project dat ik juist kom te noemen. Het project noemt de NetLab. What's in a name, a network for uh, local active burgers. Um, right, let's uh, have some words more in, uh, in English also now. Uh, so dear participants, also those are of course, um, as from now, maybe we, we're going to switch definitely to, to English. Uh, in brief, I explained in Dutch uh, that this year uh, the focus of the Kurdish Institute will be uh, on Rojava, of course, a team as, as such, values, its principles. And that's of course for, for many good reasons. Uh, and I'm referring to the, the ethnic cultural diversity of the people uh, living in that uh, region. Gender equality is something very un unique and even revolutionary for states and uh, nations uh, in the Middle East. And uh, above all, uh, the participants, the participative, participative uh, democracy, of course. Um, because regardless of uh, the origin, the culture or the religion of the people, everyone is able to participate in uh, the policy and decision making. So it makes that everybody uh, has a voice. So the outcome of the six webinars that we're going to organize in the coming weeks and months is that we are going to consolidate all the gathered uh, information and uh, have uh, something like uh, a written final uh, report on that addressing needs, tools for the use of our project on one hand uh, and detect improvements in the participative democratic system, something that can be subject to, to discussions even later on. Uh, and as a little reminder and refreshment, allow me to share maybe once more also uh, the screen because um, what I would like to show you is indeed the current picture of uh, just a moment to, to share. I need to do this, of course. That's NetLab. So what I wanted to, to point out is uh, to just as a reminder and a refreshment is uh, when you look at this map, uh, I need to stress, of course, this is, this is Rojava, that's where it's situated. Uh, and I need to stress uh, that Turkey has invaded uh, Efri, Afrin, uh, what you see at the left side of the picture of the map, uh, uh, in 2018 and took aggressively uh, control of, of that region, of that part of uh, Rojava. And now more recently, you have also the situation that, uh, that uh, in 2019, Turkey, in, in October 2019 it was, Turkey attacked uh, once more uh, the, the north of Syria and took uh, control of uh, what you could call the type of uh, belt uh, in the very north uh, near the border with Turkey. Um, so that, that just uh, what I did here is to, to show you, in fact, what, what is the current situation uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Rojava now. Um, so, Zosan, finally, I come back to you and I'm pretty convinced that uh, there's a lot of information that I, uh, I did not uh, mention during this introduction. Um, the purpose of, the, of our session today is to provide our audience an overview of what uh, I would uh, like to call the Rojava model, uh, the system and the model applied in Northeast uh, Syria. Um, so everything about the management uh, system, the structure of its institutions and so on. So for us uh, as an audience, it's, it can be difficult to imagine what a society without a state, the, the stateless democracy as they call it, uh, looks like uh, uh, and, and how, how we organize power and decisions without 
without state mechanisms. So uh, let me start maybe immediately by asking you this question. In a, can you, in a comprehensive way for the audience, can you explain how this system is organized and how it works? I leave the floor to you now, uh, Zazan. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for the question for this opportunity. Uh, first of all, uh, let me just um, inform you that I am just in Shahba, where the IDP of Afrin are living now. Uh, if you can just put the, the, the map one more time, uh, Eric. Yes, of course, I can. The last map you shared with us. Yes, I will do that. Just a moment. Yes. So my connection will be, um, okay. So my connection will be really, uh, it's really bad. Actually, I'm in very uh, critical and bad humanitarian um, uh, situation. Uh, it's just to highlight that uh, here about 150,000 people are living. Uh, they're IDP from Afrin. They are living in Shahba and they are living in a place just destroyed I and mean, entirely destroyed. The place that I'm now, there are no qualification, there are no hot um, heating, there are no hot food. Um, I felt myself that I traveled to like uh, 100 uh, uh, years uh, 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 because um, the way that they're living is really bad and I think we need to highlight about their situation and humanitarian situation and the demographic change that they are facing and every time and every day there are people dying, suffering and there are no only one uh, humanitarian NGO supporting these people here, even not UN agencies, um, not ICRC, nobody is supporting these people, they are just trying to organize themselves um, by their own power, their own on on work. There are no schools. There are nothing. It's just to highlight about the situation. Maybe we can just come back later to this situation. Anyway, um, the question you asked it's really it's really big question, and I think all of us we can just share them the answers, our each answers. Um, maybe I have been uh, uh, following the, the, the revolution, the Syrian revolution in general, the Northeast one uh, specifics from the beginning. And uh, just following how these people have been able to organize health, uh, maybe because they have uh, already some uh, background about how the social uh, cap Social um, uh, 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 contracts can be done, and how they can be uh, working, and how they work the capital, uh, social capital, um, community capital. Like uh, let's say, uh, you mentioned that we will have, like you will have a six uh, time. We'll be highlighting um, a topic. And I think there are really good topics um, and a good report can be come out uh, from these questions. Now, just let me explain that in Northeast Syria, uh, the, the, the system is very diff different sometimes about what we hear uh, from the outside. Here in Northeast East Syria, we have like seven civil councils. Uh, we have Kobani Civil Council, we have member civil councils, Zor Civil Council, Raqqa Civil Council, Jazeera Civil Council, Afrin Civil Council, and we had before Tel Abyad Civil Councils, which is now occupied by Turkey and Syrian affiliated. These civil councils, they have, they have like a bigger or, or smart, more centralized uh, civil for North Syria. And uh, this, this uh, civil council is just organizing and uh, and coordinating between each other to exchange, like economic change, like economic interests, and uh, and all the things. And in each uh, civil council, they have their own uh, they have their own uh, like twelve committees um, about the uh, women committee. They have like agriculture committee, economy. 
committee and uh, like different committees. And these are, and down we have like councils in each uh, part of this city. And then we have commune, which is the smallest um, uh, uh, groups or what the name is, uh, the, the, group, the, the smallest group it um, can unit like uh, 100 people or more like I think 100 uh, uh, um, uh, uh, houses and like this. So in general, this is how the mechanism of the work is in, in Syria. And um, the, 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 the best things in this, in this um, system that they're exchanging. I mean, they have their own self-economy and then they exchange if there are some needs. For example, we have in Membej, like a cross border uh, and Membej, and it's a good economy for Membej. So they exchange with the oil from, for example, uh, their resort or from GC. So I think this is a good point because the people are feeling that they have everyone has their own right and they are independent in the same under union. And in each civil council, you have representative of the different um, component, components. Like, for example, in, in, you have Turkmen, you have Kurds, you have Arab, you have Charkas. So everyone have their own representing representers in this civil council. Then we have in Raqqa, for example, only Arab and Kurds and some Turkmen, so they are represented. So it's like this a system is working. And then behind that, in, uh, in, 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 in parallel of that, we have like uh, political uh, parties. And uh, like, for example, we have, they have their political parties. And sometimes the representatives come from the, their parties. They choose their parties. Uh, I'm talking about the civil councils from the down, but up. Um, it's about election, and now they're organizing for an election, a new election, a general election in Northeast Syria. Um, so they are organizing for that in six um, months. And then we have the women's representatives, and it's um, the, the system of coaches. Maybe everyone, sometimes, somehow, they have a background about this system. But I think it's uh, really interesting to talk about this, this system later. Uh, I don't know if, um, uh, if there are more information I should sh share. Um, it's just because it's a big question for a girl, really, because now they are in under embark, you know. I traveled from uh, Semalka to Al Shahba, and I traveled like by there are people organizing your, your travel, your trip. And this is the first time, for example, it's really hard to travel from Northeast Syria, like from the, the, the self-administration area to Al Shahba. And the regime is putting very good embargo uh, on, on everything coming out from this region or in or out in general. And then you have Turkish group uh, affiliated, they are, they are all, even they have like their embargo about this region. Coming from Iraq, it's, it was really difficult this time. Uh, too much questions about what you are doing there, what you will do, why you are traveling. It's the first time that someone asked the own citizens of one country asking why I'm from Syria. So they ask why you are going to Syria. It's a big question for me. So I'm going because it's my country. It's, a, it's not logic the question, but if they ask you what you do there, it's like an embargo in total. And now talking about somehow, let me just highlight about a very small um, uh, situation, Eric, the economic situation around Syria, it's really bad. It's really, the sanctions are very hard and it's very strict. So the people are in very bad situation. It's not before, like I came like two years ago and now, so it was really, uh, really bad. The good about the question, and I will end here, that the people in every place, they have their own social contract. And this is good, you know, you can see that the people social contract written by them, somehow maybe not written like academic written, but the people have their own social contract. So like 
They told me, Susan, you can do this here, but you cannot do it in other place. You can do in this, this um, city, but you cannot do that in other city. So it's a social contract between the people. And, uh, and I think it's from the first time comparing the situation between Northeast and other parts of Syria. And the people now it's, are more convinced and are more unit to this uh, self-administration. I saw people that before they was really against this self-administration and now they think that this administration is good, but it should be better. So they are now not talking about this administration cannot be, it's illegal, it's not legitimate. No, these are not the home or now of the people. The people are talking about this administration is good, we can make our social contract. So the people can respect our co social contract between the components, but we should make it better. So this is good um, to listen, to hear it from, from uh, the people. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much already for that. Uh, I understand indeed this is, uh, especially due to the situation, it makes it very specific, of course, but what is happening now and that the, the changes within the last two years are so huge. Um, I, first of all, I, I would call, re recall the fact that uh, for all the people and all the participants that uh, please, if you want to, to ask something and already intervene here, it would have been said, it's, uh, it's your place. Yeah, take, take, uh, take the mic and, uh, and please do so. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I would like to come back maybe on, on, the, on, the type, uh, on the thing that you mentioned with regards to the, the social contract. And, and, and the social contract is something what, what I, what I, when I read about that, it's very, very unique also. Uh, is, is it, um, we can, can you say that now all different groups of people have been uh, that living, living in, uh, in the region of Rojava now, and in order Syria, I mean, uh, are, are complying with what is written in the, in the social contract? Are they, are they aligned with it now? Yes, somehow, yes, because before, you know, we as in uh, living in Middle East, all the time we are in love <laughs> with every single system coming from Europe, for example, or America or from other parts of the world, because every time we do something, we say, no, this cannot be happened because we don't have this model for example, in Spain, in Belgium, in Switzerland, or like now, I think after 11 or 10 years of these revolutions and of this crisis, I think the people began to, to understand that every single community had their own social contract. My social contract cannot be comparing with the social contract in Switzerland, for example. For example, in Iraq, even, even we are very similar, but we have our own uh, uh, com different components. We have our own different group. We have our own problems and challenges. So the people now are convinced that this social contract is the beginning of somehow a peacemaking, you know. What is the peacemaking? The peacemaking is having a social contract. Everyone should see uh, themselves on this social contract and it should be written regarding to the interests of the people. So then um, uh, this how we can explain or how we can input this social contract as practice. So I think after 10 years of crisis and this social contract have been written like some, for example, in 2013 in a first time in Al Jazeera Canton, and then it went to Kobani and then to Raqqa and Membej and their resort. And then they, they just wrote their own social contract in 2018, the new one after the liberation of Raqqa and the Rezor and Membej from ISIS. So they joined the, the administration. So new social contract should be done. So they did it in 2018. And I think now the people are seeing themselves in this social contract. Now you can see more Arab people in this administration. You can travel to the Rezor and you cannot find even one put in this, this administration, but they are still saying to the, admin, to, the, to the regime, for example, for the negotiation, that we are part of the civil uh, uh, self-administration and you can just discuss it with self-administration. We have a social contract, we respect our social contract. And this is 
Uh, you can see it in uh, Syrian democratic forces, in Syrian democratic council. You can see it even in political groups. You can see it in the civil councils, their own civil councils. Uh, I was very, very shocked that the Syrian democratic forces told me that the Arabs now are more than 60% in these uh, uh, forces. And this is good, you know. It's not good because we think that military um, uh, groups or military uh, forces should be more. No, we think it's good because these people are now convinced that they should respect their social contract. Uh, if there are some problems by uh, with, with, with in some places, for example, you have a um, committee which is called um, Majlis al Ayan, it's something called um, uh, Council of the Old People, you know, so it's something like that. I don't know exactly the translation. And this is coming from the leaders of the tribes. Um, why I'm saying that? Because before there was a lot of problems in the administration that the people are saying, the technocrat people are saying that why you have the leader of the tribe in such a very uh, technocrat position, these people should be in the community position, not technocrat. So they did some reform, like um, they offered the, the work and the positions to in the administrations to the technocrat. And these leaders, uh, tribes leaders, Kurds or Arabs or others, they have their own council. So if there are some problems, some community problems, so you can find the solution with these people. And it's um, uh, formed by every single one in Northeast Syria, every single tribe, no matter how much big are or small group are, they have this council. And this council are um, the, 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 the uh, the side or the part who should follow every single um, like social contract, how it's going, where it should be changed, where it should be better. So I think this time, Eric, my, my trouble, um, I noticed that the people are respecting their social contract. One tribe, one leader tribe from Raqqa told me um, that for us, the day we write our social contract, it's the day we begin with the peace in Syria. So this should be in other parts of Syria. This is a big and a good um, uh, to, 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 to listen it from someone who have been controlled by Syrian regime for 40 years, Ba'ath regime, and then they have been controlled by somehow some groups. Um, first was free army and then there was Part of Turkey. So then you have ISIS for years and years killing these people and, and they did all the radical idea on these people. And now you have Syrian Democratic Council and the self-administration and they are talking about the social contract, the importance of social contract. So I think, yes, it's um, um, unique. Uh, not, all, not only what is written is a social contract, it's unique because the people decide to write their social contract, you know, and they know the importance of the social uh, contract in general. And, and the social contract is something that is a living, a living something, and it's a living document, or is a living uh, official document? Is it, is it uh, refreshed or updated? Uh, yes. Yeah, and who takes, who takes responsibility of yes. doing that? it's updated in 2015. Yes. Um, it's updated in 2018 after the liberation of Deir Zor and Raqqa and Membej. Mm -hmm. And it's something written, it's a paper. So it's written very clearly um, that these regions are completing each other economically and socially. And um, uh, every single problem can be re resolved by dialogue. And if the dialogue is um, not taking us to some solution, we should like have a third part and the third part is some leaders of the tribes. It's very detailed, you know, it's written like very single, um, with very single topic and details and uh, yeah. Ik blijf het zeggen mensen ook, we zei het in Dutch, dus dat er altijd interactief maar gereageerd worden, zoals ik al zei. I have a few questions actually about this social contract. It's not 
really clear to me on what level they are made. I mean, you're talking about sometimes we or people or tribes. What's the, is it on, how can I imagine it is on, on level of a village, a community, a region, or how, how does it go? And is it covering one issue, more issues? Who is in charge of, um, or who has the mandate to draw up these social contracts? And I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about the technicity behind how it, how it is developed? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, um, I, I tried to explain from the beginning. Thank you. Um, in North East, there's a system that you have come in and the come in do their election. Uh, how I, I, I don't want to talk about the mandate or like the legitimacy of this come in because it's another issue, but I will try to just explain the process. You have the come in and from the come in you have um, uh, region, not region, like it's a um, small region, <laughs> um, council, and then you have um, uh, canton council, like something like canton, and then you have civil councils up. And these civil councils, how I, as I, I, I explained before, are made by the leaders of the, the region of the community. Lead, um, community region um, leaders like tr Arab tribes, like um, political groups, like um, you know. So our our um, community, we know who is the leader of every community. For example, I come from the Sheikhi, lead, uh, Sheikhi tribe, Kurds tribe. So I know who is my leader. Not because I do the election, it's because it comes from the big one, the oldest one, the minds one, like this. So the, the contract have been written by the civil councils represented. For example, in Northeast Council, uh, we have like um, a representative of uh, the Resort Civil Council, Raqqa Civil Council, Member Civil Council, Kobani Civil Council, Jazeera Civil Council, Afri Civil Council, and Tal Abiyya. The social contract have been written by these people, by the representative of every uh, civil council in, uh, in in northeast Syria, and there are seven. So the details, the issues are very detailed. They they talk about like about the peace, about the exchange, about the interests, about uh, somehow uh, the power or every uh, civil council uh, like this, you know. About the mandate, <laughs> I think it's a question we are living in, in Northeast, we are living in um, war zone, um, who give the mandate and who give the legit legit legitimacy of this, uh, this, uh, these things. I think it can be discussed like in, in total, in all Syria, who have the legit legitimacy. Now in, North in Syria, one who has legitimacy, who is the one who is offering them the, the, the services, who is fighting for, for, for the, the security and the safety of the people who are oppressing, like I said, services and other things. And before it was like, all are talking about legit legitimacy because we think that someone like America or Russian or European should give us the legitimacy, not be as a people. So now doing somehow some elections to see how the people would join these elections, maybe it's a symbolic election or not. I cannot talk about that now. It's not, I, I didn't have more information about it, but in general is that this is about the, 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 the social contract. Thank you. I don't know if I, I give the answer, Carl. I am not sure. <laughs> well, I, I think we can continue about this for hours and days and weeks, maybe. But uh, no, you explained me something, and I see that Oran also has a question, so I will pass the, the word to him. But nevertheless, uh, thank you very much for your answer, and I will continue thinking and reflecting on the answer. 
Okay, Oran, I thought indeed you raised your hand, Oran, so please uh, join us. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, so I have a, a question for, uh, for Zosan. Uh, so uh, about uh, the society uh, in Rojava and, uh, and, and the political structures. You know, we know that uh, uh, the society and the people uh, in, in, in Rojava and Syria, uh, but also in the Middle East in general, uh, are uh, very different uh, from what we know from here in Europe. I live here in Europe. I was born here in Europe and I live here all my life. And, uh, but of course, I, I know my people in the Middle East too. And uh, I notice uh, big differences about the societies here in the West and in the Middle East. And uh, the societies in the Middle East are conservative. In general, they are conservative. And uh, they're not that liberal, actually. And, uh, and uh, also, uh, families and tribes are very important also among the Kurds, uh, the Arabs, and the others too. And uh, so on the one hand, you have this uh, democratic, autonomous, uh, you know, uh, region with, with a political structure and, and constitution. You have uh, constitutional bodies there and so on. And they try to implement democracy. And on the other hand, you have... Uh, uh, a, a tribal system also existing altogether. Uh, how do you uh, how do you work with this two uh, systems? Uh, how do you combine this? And uh, does this give some uh, difficulties uh, uh, to work, or uh, do you see it as an opportunity? Because uh, uh, at some areas it, this can be an opportunity too. So, what what is your opinion about this? Was the question clear, Susan? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you, Orhan. Yeah, I think if maybe all of us have some background about the difference about, let's let's name it like, like we have a difference about Arab society, <laughs> Kurdish society, and Christian society, which is a Syriac one, and, 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 and yeah. And this is the biggest um, challenges we face it, not me. I mean, when I say we, I mean, I, I say in general, it was when we had like the woman lays. I don't know if you, if you listened about it, like the woman lays, like they have 12, um, um, uh, 12 like topic that uh, most important for the Arab people was, and they ignore it, they don't want it. It's having four women, four wives, and the sharing of the um, uh, legacy, you know. So I think that is for, um, at the beginning, they was like radical and the feminine, I'm um, like the woman Kurdish, um, um, Kurdish woman movement, they was like radical that yes, we can do it. We can, uh, they will listen it. It's a time of revolution. We, we, we like this. But in the practice, you face a lot of challenges. And this, let's be realistic, like Orhan said, we have tribe system. Yes, we have democratic system. We are trying to do some balance. I see that the, the, the administration, a lot, let's say the political movement here in, in Northeast, um, they are trying to do some, uh, some balance. You boiled your democracy system and you tried step by step to change the society. I will give you a, 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 an example. When now you go to the resort, in the checkpoints, you see women, women side by side with men. This is a revolution. Even they are with their, um, uh, their hijab and even they are still having is Islamic, Islam background and all these things, but it's a revolution. You see women in Asayish, in police, you see women in Kocher, you see women in, um, in, in every single um, committee of the administration. In Yepage, even, even in civil in Syrian Democratic Forces, you can see women from the resort, women from Raqqa, women from Tabqa, women from Membej. You can see them. Maybe they are a small number, but you can see them. My point is, what I'm trying to say, that I think in the beginning, if the self-administration didn't 
do somehow um, a balance, we would had very bad situation now because you cannot change the community and the, asso the so society like just putting um, lays and rules and you say, this is my administration and you should do it. No, you cannot change the thousand years of, of this, uh, this background and this culture. This need time, this need um, uh, to, to, to fight for that. The way you fight, it's the importance now. And I think they, see, they, they change it. For example, what is the people now saying? That in Arab uh, uh, places, Arab cities like Raqqa, Deir Zor, Tabqa, Mumbaj, you, you can have three or four wives. Somehow it's not good scene, but you can have. <laughs> but in the Kurd city, it's it's forbidden. You cannot. <laughs> and the courts say that it's unfair. You know, <laughs> it's unfair. You know why they can have four? We are Islam too. They are Islam too. It's unfair. You can manage your society as a Kurd people, yeah. but you cannot do the Arabs. And they are changing and step by step. The importance for me as a feminist, like not I'm not a feminist, but I am with women rights, and I say myself women rights, the importance for me that there's some change. Maybe it's not a huge change, but there's some change. Like you can now, uh, you can travel to the resort and Raqqa, and all the time I'm naming these, these cities because they was the capital of ISIS. And in their resort, the tribes are very powerful. You can see women just a few uh, weeks ago, ISIS killed two women from their resort because they was part of the administration. And because they say um, uh, yes to be part of the, the political uh, system or the political uh, leave in Syria. So Orhan, we try to do some balance and I think this balance is going good. Uh, sometimes they are, um, a facing between two systems, and this facing is from the women movement, <laughs> because the Kurdish women movements they are radical. They they sometimes they they forget that what the situation of the Kurdish people now it's because of forty years of struggles. You know, we didn't change these Kurds people like just we came because we love democracy. No, we are part of the middle age society. So we are somehow mm, uh, affected by this system. But from 40 years ago, when the people decide to go to the mountain and the women follow and went to the mountain side by side with men, this was the beginning of the changing of our society. So we cannot uh, compare between a society which is struggling with the women's rights like 40 years ago and with the people who just begin after ISIS um, uh, uh, it's a defeated uh, system. So this is, uh, I don't know if I give the good answer or, yeah, so. Oh, uh, thank you very much. It's I have other questions yeah. too, but uh, I will wait to other people. Uh, uh, you can go ahead. I didn't say another hand raised, uh, Oran, so please be my guest. I think we can share information. Uh, okay, so uh, my second question is about the legal system uh, in the political region there, in the northern part of Syria. Uh, with legal system, I mean, uh, how do you practice uh, justice? Uh, because it is a very new system, uh, it has to be consolidated maybe, even more, and uh, you have there uh, different kind of balances uh, you have to be careful of. Uh, for example, uh, so it's a tribal system in essence. And uh, let's say that an Arab man uh, does something wrong and, uh, and you have to punish him. But he is uh, a member of an Arabic tribe uh, and which is an important tribe, tribe for example. And uh, you have to have good relations with that tribe. So, uh, so you have to think to other things too, uh, for implementing some, uh, you know, justice and so on. Uh, how does this work in practice? Uh, are there legal committees, justice committees at the local level? 
Are there uh, courts? And how are the courts organized? Um, do you have information about this? Thank you very much. Yeah. What do you mean? I mean, do you mean written one or the practice one? <laughs> because it's different. <laughs> uh, the practice one. I mean, yeah. Um, about the written, um, they have very good system written, some from the Arab Syrian um, uh, justice uh, laws and other from international ones. So yeah, about the practice, it's very complicated. Uh, why? Because let's not talk only about the Arab tribes. No, in the Kurdish community, we have families. We have also tribes. We have um, um, the, 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 the family of the, um, some leaders, you know. So you face the justice here <laughs> somehow. It's about, it depends on the guilt, you know. Um, uh, let's begin with the Arabs, you know. If it's not like, we have different, different, um, uh, 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 um, how to say, different, um, uh, different uh, guilt, you know. If it's not like a very big guilt, it can be resolved by the Arab tribes and um, like some called uh, justice um, uh, uh, families and justice group and somehow they have different groups about that. If that be built, you know, it goes to the court and justice, and then he have his uh, like five years or four years, depend. And then also they have some like uh, 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 intermediate between them, and they try to find um, a solution. And then you have like in Kurdish community, families, power, and these people. For example, just a few months ago. Uh, one from big family in Jazeera, uh, Canton, he did very big guilt, you know. So he's uh, a family of the martyr. And the father said, that if you take my boy, my son to the court, I will just go to the, <laughs> some places and I will put fire in my body, you know. You cannot do it. We are family of martyr. It's very big guilt for us, blah, blah, blah. So they try to resolve it then, like in ways. The good is, that we have written justice it can be implemented like whenever we have like a um, system where is uh, uh, when the system is really um, realist you know but now what i i don't have like big questions but what i see from my own experience having um, stories from the community and society they are just trying to resolve the problems in very pacific way if it's not big guilt, you know. Um, we cannot, you know, our, for example, prisons are full, full of ISIS. We have like 22,000 uh, ISIS member in our prisons, you know. And you, ha you don't have women prisons, for example. We don't have women prison in Northeast. Even we have like women who are part of, of, of terrorist uh, organization or make some guilt or kill someone, but we don't have a woman uh, presence, for example. Uh, so I think now, because the, the situation is really um, critics and we are living in, in a place that we, even we have our social contract, uh, somehow you should respect the community justice. For example, the Badu, the Badu says that which who gives you the power to do justice with me? Because I have been thousands and thousands of years. I, I have my own uh, justice uh, program, my own justice uh, system. You cannot interrupt my, my system. And it's the same with the Arab tribe somehow, you know. So, so yeah, they are, they are um, courts and they are um, based on somehow in Syrian law and international law. And it's about your uh, about the guilt you did, you know, uh, like this. Yeah, I'm, I, I think I'm just trying to make a balance between the realistic uh, situation and what is written in the papers and what is really done. I don't know if others have some because, for example, I have the Mr. Daurish Fatho, we have Hassan, we have Sen Omar. So I, this is the name I know. If they want to add something and maybe some I lost, 
uh, I forget some information or I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I see uh, two more hands raised uh, already at the cattle. Keller will come back to you afterwards, but uh, give the word to Kuhn. Uh, yes, please. You say there is no women prison, but like, for instance, the prison, uh, the, the the camp of Al Hol, isn't that the prison camp for ISIS uh, women? Uh, that's how it's uh, how it is uh, shown here in the in the media. So I don't quite understand uh, that. No, it's not a prison. You know how is this? The whole is working. I have been working on whole. The whole is three parts. Um, in total, you have uh, 69,000 people inside Al Hol, children, women, and all the things. And you have like uh, Iraqi sections, it's about 31,000. You have Syrian sections, it's 29,000. And you have like the foreign sections, and it's like 18,000 with children and women. They are, it's not a prison. Maybe they don't have the freedom of, of movement to go to the city and come back, but the the camp is open, you know, it's free. They have their own mobile, they have their own um, school somehow, they have their own shops, you know. It's very, it's like, um, they know, they name it now a city of Al Hol, not only a camp Al Hol, because it's a big. The only thing that they don't have the freedom of traveling to the, the Hasaki or the city to go out, but inside the camp, they are somehow um, free. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the movement and yeah for me that is if you're not free to go then it's a prison to me yeah? sorry yeah actually in every camp in, in even in europe you have a camp and they have their own clothes and they have their own system for example i have been working in a camp in in greece and they don't they're not free to go out because for example they don't have paper and they don't have uh, identity card, so they are not free to go out of the camp. And also, you have a camp in 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 in, in Germany in 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 Karlsruhe. Uh, I have relatives living there. They are not free of give or going every time they want. Uh, they have um, hours how where they can in and be out. And the camp on whole, they have it's a very different camp, you know. You cannot name it camp, you can name it prison. I can agree with you somehow. But we are talking about uh, 18,000 ISIS women and children. So if you take the woman and put it in the castle, in the, in, the, in the prison, what you will do with the children? Each of them, they have like five and six children. And if you make it free, maybe they have the, the right of free um, uh, uh, movement. But for example, in... They don't have a statue in Syria. They are not IDP like the Iraqi, so they are free to go and come and to visit their relative if they go, uh, they give them the, the, the address where they are going and they come back to sleep inside the camp. And um, they are not a uh, refugee. Uh, no, Iraqi are refugee and the Syrian are IDP. So these foreigns, they don't have a statue to go. They don't have ID. They don't have... I don't know you go. I, got, I can give you an example. We have like um, a treatment with the, the leaders in, 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 in Raqqa and their resort uh, to let the, peop the women go back to their own village. And yeah, they're right. They, go, they want to go. They are not part of ISIS maybe. They are just wives and house uh, women and housekeepers and all these things. So they went to Raqqa. Uh, I have been part of the program, follow-up program. And they are not anymore in Raqqa, now in Idlib or in Jarablus. So what I'm saying that, yes, uh, you are right. The, the people on the cap, they should have their uh, freedom of movement. And this is the right of every one of us, freedom of movement everywhere. And we have been living in Europe and we had like our freedom of movement. We had every single thing to respect us as a people and, and human rights, you know. But in Al Hol, it's different. We discussed with the coalition to create a woman castle and woman prison, you know, because some of them, they have been leaders of ISIS. And we know the names, we know who have been working with social media, advocacy for ISIS. Some of them, they have been part of chemical uh, uh, weapons. 
they have a background. I mean, we have a background of our single, every single one in, in Al Hol. But then we had like a challenge, what we will do with the children. We are talking about like more than 12,000 children, you know, what we will do with the children. So yes, I join you with they have right, they should have the right, but also the situation, their situation, it's, it's critical, it's complicated, you know. Mm -hmm. And we are not living in a country that we have security system or very good um, um, uh, um, safety uh, system. We are in as a war on ISIS is just bad, you know, just, Yesterday morning, they killed seven uh, from the uh, Syrian Democratic uh, Forces in, in, in Asia. And in every day we have people died in al Um Only in this month, and the month is not ended yet, we have like eight people killed inside al Uh And most of them, they are Iraqi because they try just to be part of the administration or the camp administration. So yeah, somehow I join you. And somehow when I listen to the concerns of the administration in camp administration, I can understand their concern. Yeah, so to yeah, be, I cannot yeah. be part of this or yeah. this, you know. <laughs> just to be clear, I'm not advocating yeah. that everybody should run around freely. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying, but uh, yeah. I, and I will, thanks for explaining it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand why I'm saying that, you know, because I say that because now no willing to take this woman back for example to the, uh, the the european people doesn't want to take their citizens back so somehow you should you should think about the future of these people the women the children how they can move they cannot be all the the life in this camp the children after 10 years most of them maybe six years they have they are more uh, uh, they have 18 years they cannot be living all the time in a camp but it's okay. complicated. Um, yeah, sure. It's, it surely is a complicated topic, absolutely. It, uh, but I won't to do too far on this topic because that's indeed a quite another one. But um, uh, two more hands. I saw Kuni. I, did you have another question? Uh, because no, no. Two? How do I uh, unraise my hand? Because uh... Uh, I will do that for. I will come back to that, and I will do that for you in that okay, case. Okay, thank you. Host. Sorry. <laughs> But uh, I saw two more people asking for uh, for a question, and that's uh, once more, Carol. I will leave the word to you, and then afterwards we go to Hassan. Okay, thank you, Eric. Yes, I would like to go back to the initial topic of today, the Rojava model and its um, governmental structure. Let's say um, I, I was wondering about two things because you, sp you spoke, Sudan, about um, politics, economy, and punishment, and these kind of things. I'm wondering if, if there's also something that has to do with mental health, that's one thing. And um, what are the powers of the local communities? Because that, that's something that I didn't catch yet. And that interests me also when looking to the project that uh, Kurdish Institute wants to develop. You know. That's a good one, Carol. That's what was one question on my list also. <laughs> okay, please, uh, Susan. Yeah. You know, um, if you ask me this question like before um, four, four months ago, I will be like, the people doesn't need um, psychological or health um, or um, um, uh, what, uh, what you called it. Sorry, I just <laughs> like um, yeah, mental well being, let's uh, say. Mental health, uh, yeah. yeah. Why? Because I think I, I was thinking before that. Um, if you have a good economy, if you have safety, if you have um, stability, so you have a good health, you know. Um, so like four months ago, I lost my father. So he, 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 I lost him and it was like a big surprise, big shock for me. So I had to go to, I needed like um, uh, uh, some support, mental support. Now I am advocating for that, you know. <laughs> I was really stupid, stupid about thinking that only being in a safe zone, uh, having your children, having your home, being safety, it's, you can be good in mental, you know. And now I think, no, it's not like this. The people need mental health. And especially who are working with IDPs 
and living in the zone that all the time they are in movement of bombing. Like, for example, I saw people in Anaisa last day, yesterday I was in Anaisa, and the people told me that they have their own essential things in the car and ready to go every single time. And uh, the people are talking about how they are suffered. They are not anymore um, uh, afraid like in body. They are afraid here, you know. So they are nothing about mental health here in Northeast, you know. There are some programs done in IDP camps, but it's very small programs. And I don't want to be bad, bad one to say that it's only fond, about fond, very symbolic, you know, just having a picture, having a woman, for example, in um, a, a, a room and having some picture and for the donors, look, I did some mental health. No, there are no real mental health like I had in like three months ago when I lost my father. It was really mental health. It helped me to come back to life, to, to build myself one more day. And here, for example, now I am in Anshahba and with the people who are IDP from Afrin. And today the women are telling me, a, ma a, a, a mother of a martyr, one, she is telling me that I cannot believe that just three kilometers or four kilometers is my home. I cannot go to my home. And, and this for me, it's like mental. All the time I go to walk and I am, without knowing, I am just walking to Afrin, you know. So these people need mental health. But the problem is you cannot offer mental health if they are just all the time in um, a, a, a tent. And somehow some people, they does not have anything to eat. You know, I saw people in Anhol a few days ago when I was there. They told me that it have been like three years they don't have bread. So how I will talk about mental health in the time they don't have anything to eat. So the question is to your answer, there are no mental health here, no people caring about mental health. The only mental health here for them, the therapy is talking to each other. And a woman told me that she doesn't uh, feel bad anymore because everyone now they have martyrs, everyone lost um, child. She does feel that they are the only one who had this pain, you know. So there are not, no people, no programs about the mental health. I try to offer a, um, the EU um, a program that to, to the mental health, especially to the ITPs. And um, unfortunately, they don't have phone for North Syria, and uh, they are not caring about North East Syria. I talked to the USAID, the coalition, about a program. So all the time they are just highlighting all the women from the ISIS uh, um, uh, areas and people. So I will just end here, just telling you a story. I met a, a woman, she is working with the ISIS uh, woman in, in Al Hol, and she lost her child in, she's AZD. She lost her child in Shengal. So she said, she told me, Susan, all the time, I see how I'm helping this woman. I go back home. I think I am, it's unfair. I am just doing something to my child. They killed my child and now I'm saving these people. Sometimes I feel like I want to kill myself. I cannot anymore. So the people are suffering. Everyone here is suffering. Even the people who are working with the administration, they have maybe all the needs, but they have, they need mental health because imagine yourself listening to people, thousands and thousands of people all the day, and they're talking about only pain. They're not talking anything, just pain, needs, going home, demographic change, bombarding. So I, I feel like it's too much pain to people need some mental health. So I don't know how we can develop some program about that or work on that together, but yeah, they need mental health. Thank you for your answer. I'll continue reflecting on it also. Thank you. It was a very impressive testimony. Um, we have uh, one question remaining and it's uh, from Hassan, please. Yes. Uh, hello, Suzanne. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about your personal loss, you spoke about that, and I, I want to concentrate on the question about these women and children. Uh, okay, we can uh, 
call them a let's say open prison if it's not camp it's an open prison but what is the administration's goal what what's administration's planning for reintegrating these people into the society this is the main thing we cannot all the time speak about the uh, coalitions and the other forces for instance Belgians to take their own back home the others I mean, you know that this is international thing there, but what is the uh, concrete planning by the administration itself, how to run these camps and how to reintegrate these people into the Syrian society? Because possibly those who are from Syria, from other parts of Syria, so they may be re, uh, let's say, uh, joined to their own area. I, I know that we don't have the uh, answer to all questions, but what is the general plan? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we are going very far from away from our topic, but I will be very we're very short in that, Mr. Hassan. The project is, um, it should be discussed with the coalition and the international community because it's not a Syrian topic, it's international topic. Regarding the Syrian one, um, they are just going out uh, like bats and bats every every Monday, I think, or Thursday. Um, so they, some of them, they go to their relatives. Some of them, they just rent houses and, and to stay in northeast. Most of them, they are not going back because they come from the re re gen uh, um, um, regime area. And who can go to back to Bakos or Al? Uh, Hajin and cities, uh, so they are going back. Regarding the Iraqi, they don't want to go anymore. Nobody is um, signing about the return because in the beginning in 2018, we handled three ones, three IDPs to Iraqi um, uh, government, and they killed them because they have death, um, death uh, uh, penalty. So after that, no one will go <laughs> back to Iraq. So they are staying. And al whole in general, historically, it's an Iraqi um, uh, camp. So they have been here years and years, not only new ones. Regarding the international ones, it should be discussed with them. It's not our only our program. We cannot think like that. And I think the main point of that, that these people are the citizens of European uh, cities, uh, countries, they should take their citizens. This is the only program we have because it's a big number. In Al Hol, we have like 18,000. In Al Roj, we have like 6,000. So in general, it's two, two, 22,000 people. So we cannot handle it. We don't have the economic power. We don't have the, the experience to trade these people. And we cannot put them in, in, in prison because they have children. We don't have program for these children because we don't have ID for them. We don't, we don't have the, 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 re, the state for them. You know, the state, the, the, I don't know, but we don't have a, a something for them. But now there are other people who are thinking in plan like, as the citizens, as, as, as European country, they want only their children. They don't want the women, the men, the mothers. So if the, the women sign on that, I think it can be negotiated to take their children. And then we have a program maybe with this woman. From my idea, my own personal perspective, if these people talk a lot of language, you know, we can't just integrate them to the community through finding a job for them or a center for them to stay. But the big issue here, it's not only what program we have for them. It, the, the big question is how much the community will have them or welcome them. Our community is not very passive community and all people are just talking about peace. No, these people have been killing our people and all of them, they are asking for justice. You know, the people are asking for justice all the time. The, 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 the family of the martyrs, they ask the, the administration about the justice. What you do for us? We need justice. So where the justice can be, this woman, how can be integrated in the community? It's very difficult, you know, it's not easy question. So I think it should be discussed 
with the coalition because if we have a rehabilitation program for them, it's a big and huge program. If we have um, justice for them, like courts and all these things, it should be international court. And if we have a just decision to leave them like this, it's a catastrophe because after years, we will have like a, a city of ISIS inside our cities, you know. So I don't know. It's a big question for me, Mr. Hassan. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's indeed a very difficult topic also. And it's, it floats a little bit further from what our initial uh, uh, objective was of course of this evening, but uh, it's indeed, but it's a delicate uh, topic. I agree on that, and I fully agree with your with your answer on that, uh, Zazan. So um, maybe I see one more hand, and it's once again from Kuni, if I'm not mistaken, and yeah. then afterwards I will finalize with a question from my and yeah. a statement, and then then I, I would uh, propose to to conclude. Kuni? I have I have a question about participation in general. Uh, if you have a participative democracy, I see uh, in general there's not a lot of enthusiasm of many people to to engage in such uh, in such participation. It's just a small part of people that will really take be active in it. How how is that in Rojava? Is it uh, is it a small per, uh, percentage that's really active, or a majority, or or is it? Can you give a percentage of people that are really engaged in this participatory process? Is it a minority or a majority? Yeah, it's a percentage, you know. <laughs> it's like other places you have like, who are really into administration and they are part of the administration. So they are active in this system. And then you have people who just are interested to know which kind of administration they are living and which, who, what this administration can provide for them. So they're interested in that, they're part, maybe not directly part of them, of that, but they are just interested. And we have a part that they are just far away from every single, about when you talk about the system, they say we are saving in, living in safe, in safety. And uh, we have our people, we have our community. So I don't, it's not, I'm not as interested in who are governing and who are in this uh, system or not. So it's percentage, you know, but in general, there are, there are many people who are, um, how I can give percentage, you know, coin. it's not because they are some static, no. I think when you are visiting normal people or people who are part of the administration or people are just like gray people, we call them, or sofa people who are just this sitting in the sofa and follow up. Um, when you listen to their critics, about the administration, you feel that they're following the administration very good, you know? Uh, so I think in total, it's not a big and huge part, but the people are somehow engaged because the economic opportunities are with the self-administration. Uh, how they are living in embargo. As uh, the, the being part of the power, let's say, I name it power, being part of the system, it should be with the administration. Um, being part of the humanitarian actors, you should be part of this administration. Um, you should be uh, registered in the commune and this commune should have the, your paper and blah, 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 other things. So it's like uh, the administration is trying somehow to have more active people in the, in the administration. Um, they have like 275,000 employees in this administration comparing with like 5 million people living in this area. So you have big number of people, of young people in STC and you have big number of people in, 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 in Asayish, in the police. And you have very and big numbers of a community com committees like tribes committee. If you are not part of the tribe committee, you are part of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, region community. If you are not part of the region community, you are part of the sport community. If now, so somehow you are part of something. So somehow you are part of this. Uh, you are related to that this administration, and you should be active in this administration. So in general, it's like this. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, uh, that uh, brings us uh, indeed. Uh, oh, thank you, because it's really yeah, you told me indeed that you were in a room that were not what not, not much heated. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> I hope you're not freezing there. <laughs> okay, so I will I will conclude anyway. No, not that much. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So no, um, it's good. I'm fine. Okay, good, good, thank you. So, um, no, and then I think uh, it's, a, it's a wise thing to conclude with every question we already have seen and heard. It's, uh, it brought us indeed uh, to, to much more insight and in-depth uh, view on, on the situation and especially the, the structure of, of, of Rojava. Um, maybe to, to conclude, uh, one, one tiny little question, I hope it's a tiny little one for you, uh, Zazan, is, okay, now the, this, it started, it, it has been founded in, if I'm not mistaken, in 2013, uh, for, for very, uh, after, very quickly after the, the, the starting of the war in, uh, in Syria. Um, now we are uh, we are 2021. Like quite quite some years have passed. Um, when you started your, your what you were explaining, the situation there is okay. Of course, due to the fact there is war, there is uh, you have the, the aggression of Turkey. You have, you have a lot of things. There is on top of that a pa pandemic situation. Uh, is it sustainable currently? Is it, can can is is the is the the, the, uh, the administration managing? Can do, or do would, would geopolitical geopolit help be be great be, be 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 welcome? And I can imagine it would be. Um, you know, for me, it's not um, not important how much stable it is. The question is how much the people is feeling they are stable or not. You know. What I am afraid and what make me like feel not that much good that the people just is under the the, the, the the thing that they will be bombarded every single minute, you know, maybe not today, tomorrow, I mean not tomorrow. So it's because maybe they have been bombarded in Russell, Sarekani and then after in until Abiyad, and we lost like areas, important areas, you know. And all the time we have a uh, Turkai attack in Ain Isa and uh, around. And then we have the regime that sometimes he closed the doors, the borders, sometimes he opened the borders. And we have the Russian that in every single meeting they lie, they promise a lot of, and then they lie, they are nothing to. And the, the question of how much Americans are uh, clear with us and we they will with us and all the things you know the administration is trying just to to enforce like making their own system more stable more flexible um, uh, more welcome to that to to the community and giving more services sometimes it's bigger than the income of the self-administration maybe they have oil it's right you know they have petrol and other things but the get the 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 the, 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 the how uh, what they are paying to the community in general, like employees or um, or helping or I, it's big. It's too much. I mean, it's not a small number. Um, uh, so in in general, uh, it can be it can stay say stable if just Turkey stopped um, uh, forcing the people to change their places. For example, I have been in Kobani. The people in Kobani are really afraid. I mean, before they was just uh, rebuilding their, their city all the time. But now you cannot see that they are rebuilding their city because they are just afraid. But combined between 2013 and now 2021, it's a big difference. It's a huge difference. The people are now um, more conscient about... Uh, the importance of this administration, the unique this administra administration is, and the big question is, if we don't have this administration, what our situation will be, you know? So um, I cannot say that they're stable, they can be stable, feeling good, no. Uh, I see that the people are afraid, but I think the administration is trying to do their best. There are sometimes in some places, 
big faults, you know, and nobody can be complete. I mean, perfect. But um, I think sometimes they are trying, somehow they are trying, especially what I saw in Shahba. I mean, in Shahba, the administration is giving water until what can you think only the administration is forcing, forcing offering this, this aid and this help. There are no work, there are no UN, UN here, there are no NGOs, there are no coalition, there are nobody here, there are no work, you know. So let's hope that this administration will, will, will develop and stay and how we who are working and staying outside in, in Europe, for example, how we can do more advocacy for this administration. Because I have a friend from Aleppo on Damascus. They say, Su Susan, that the only hope we have is from Northeast. If we lose this hope from Northeast, we will lose Syria, you know. So this is the Syrian talk, you know, not my talk. Um, so I think it needs to be more advocated. The administration, it's not good known in, in, in outside of Syria, even for the Syrian people, because we have very bad propaganda against the administration. Nobody is working for the solution in Syria. Not only we are the only people, good people working for the solution. No, we are the people who are working for the community. And we have a struggle, you know, a historic struggle uh, for that. So let's hope this administration developed. And I think we have like big mission for us to do more advocacy for this administration, more recommendation to be better. And um, yeah, let's uh, hope <laughs> that they will be, yeah, they will develop more. Well, with this uh, hope, uh, and we support that, of course, uh, by all means. Um, and let us pray indeed that, that, that there is there will become more st stabi stability in the region uh, as soon as possible. Uh, that that's uh, that's for sure. I think people, uh, we came with so it's now about one uh, hour and thirty minutes. We uh, we are busy, so that was uh, that's very nice uh, for us. That, that means that. Uh, it was it was really uh, interesting, uh, and thank you again again for all the questions that you raised, and the participation. It's all about participation. That's what we said uh, from the very start. <laughs> uh, so, um, it, to, to remind you, there is going to be the next session is going to be on the fifteenth uh, of April, and there has already been uh, well, uh, those and other people al already referred to the. the uh, the topic itself, it's going to be about the, the women's role in the society and the system of, uh, of the Northeast uh, Syria. It's going to be very interesting. Uh, we will uh, give you an, an idea on the, the speakers then uh, that will be the, 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 the current of next week. Then we will uh, publish that, that on, uh, on, uh, on our website. Meanwhile, I, I'm, for my, I, it remains to thank you all and especially, of course, uh, Zozan. Uh, for your participation, for all interesting uh, uh, contribution. Um, and I hope you get, get more warm there in the place where you are now. <laughs> okay, so people, once more, thanks again. And I will leave it to this and uh, okay. we come to an Thank end. You very much. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all, Amal. Uh, thank you. Good night.